Okay. Good night, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening. Tonight's topic is Ask the Experts um, on about game, about game Analysis. And tonight, you have with us John Hobbins, the FRC Director for Ontario, and myself, Christine Bibek. I'm stepping in for Paul Keenan, who couldn't be with us tonight. So to start off with, we're just going to pass things over to John to give us a quick update on a few things. John? Okay, hello, First Community. I hope you're very excited about the game release. Uh, we know we are too, and we're also very tired, uh, and I know you will be also. So I just want to very quickly go over a couple key points that are very important. Um, the Paul Keenan is going to release after the webinar tonight the manual quiz. So coaches, get ready for this. This is a great way to test if your team members understand what the game is about according to the manual and the rules. So that's good. So thanks, Mr. Keenan, for that. Anybody who's had missing parts uh, in their kit of parts uh, from this past one of the kickoffs in this last weekend, you have until January 12th. You can see it there in red. And there's the website, FRC Parts at firstinspires.org. You need to get your information into them as soon as possible about anything that's missing. Don't call me or Christine Bibbett because we'll just redirect you back to the site. I'd like to really emphasize the point about uh, referees. Um, First Canada needs more volunteers. We're short on referees, inspectors, and all of the volunteer positions. So most importantly, uh, this idea of referees, if you've been detached from a team for a couple of years, a uh, good example would be alumni that have gone off to the either post-secondary or the rest of their life. It would be great if they got back involved. If you need to um, let us know, contact me or contact Christine Vivek at um, firstroboticscanada.org. Uh, just to let you know, they released the Q&A site today, so it's up there. Headquarters says they have all the answers to all your questions. There it is there. You don't have enough time to write down this website link, then just go to firstinspires.org and type in Q&A for FRC. I wanted to highlight the fact that our partner here in Mississauga, Studica, has um, ordered a significant amount of parts, game pieces, uh, the milk crates with the Ziploc bags that go around them and so on. So those will be ready for distribution later this week. And there's the phone number and there is the website. Now, uh, section six is going to be comprised of um, some strategy discussion with some terrific team members we have from teams across the province, in addition to uh, the key members that are involved with the uh, Team Ontario uh, Robot in Three Days, along with the University of Waterloo Robot in Three Days. Back to you, Christine. Okay, so if we can just go to the next slide, John, we'll introduce everybody. Um, not necessarily um, in the order listed there in front of you, but um, we have with us tonight Brendan from the Hamilton group that did the robot in three days, so the Team Ontario. And we also have with us Michael from the University of Waterloo's robot in three days um, group, so we're looking forward to hearing from them. And we have several other people from different teams across the province, including, oh, let's see, where should we start? I guess at the beginning. Um, we have Gabe and we have, Fer sorry, you're going to have to remind me again, it's Feroz. Yeah, you said Feroz. Feroz, okay. And Cassidy and Shifa and Obi, and we're really looking for, and we have Sandra as well, um, who doesn't have her name on there. So anyway, some great teams here to, that we're looking forward to hearing from. And our format for tonight, um, what we're going to actually do is we're going to pose a question and, and we'll ask a specific guest to answer it. And then if any of our other guests tonight have something to add, they can pop in at the end. Um, so that we can get through all the questions in sort of a timely manner. Okay, so let's move on to our first question. Uh, John, can you move our slides forward? Well, Chris, I think uh, Mr. Keenan uh, put in the slide here, which gives you the setup of the field. Um, as I began to mention early on um, in the pre-broadcast, I was talking to some of the tonight's guests, and I just wanted to mention that um, for the audience out there, uh, and then we'll release it to the floor if any of the panelists want to offer up any suggestions or comments. Um, but this, these platforms here, 
are, it's very important for you to, I can give you tips to look at that because that ramp on there is um, fairly significant. It's at least three and a half inches high. Uh, the, and guys, please correct me if I'm wrong here on my terminology, but the scale in the middle is a very large apparatus. It's much larger than you might imagine. It makes the airship look small. And then on each end here is the um, switches, much like the upper portion of the scale here. Um, and these are also uh, quite large too. So we have actually built some of these and they will be available soon at our um, main practice locations. Uh, would any of the audience members have any comments about what they see on the screen? Any of the if you do, you can just raise your vir your virtual hand. Um, I don't see anything, John. Okay, I was wondering about the um, the robot in three days um, people if they had anything to say about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I think name. the most important thing. Sorry. Uh, each time a panelist speaks, can you start off by your name? Thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, it's Michael from the University of Waterloo's Robot in Three Days. Yep. And so I think the most important thing to recognize is just how small the scale bar is. Um, I don't think that was mentioned. And um, it is quite a lot of points. It's 30 points per climb. And it should be noted just how tiny you can actually see it right on the on the on the map. But it's super small and it'll be really difficult to fit three robots on there. So that's going to be a big piece of strategy for teams on how they're going to climb. And um, our Robot in Three Days team, and I'm sure hundreds of teams across the world, have already discovered quite a few unique ways to climb. And uh, we'll probably talk about those later. Michael, can you tell the audience roughly what size that bar is? Like, what's the length of the bar and how far out does it stick? I think it's 13 inches uh, wide and it's nine inches from the center of the uh, or from the side of the center pole. I could be wrong, though. I wasn't building the field. But that's about right. And um, when you guys are building your robots in three days, did you have any prototypes of the field or not? Uh, yeah, we built scale models of all the key elements. Um, we didn't build a full field, of course, because we didn't have the kind of time. But we did build a scaling bar, and we built a um, the platform where you put the power cubes on. Excellent. And uh, they are... Especially when you build the scaling bar, you you look at it and it's it's one of the it's it's tiny. It's it's honestly you it's it's you you could you could barely fit two of your own hands on it. That's how small it is. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, any other comments on this part? Yeah, uh, I'd like to add to what Michael said. I'm Brendan from the Team Ontario RA3D. Um, just the size of the field elements. It's great once you we got to build. Uh, some of the elements we ended up with the climbing bar and the scale completely built um, they are big and um, there really isn't that much space on the climbing bar at all so uh, uh, you'll see kind of what that's really in relation to when our uh, reveal video drops um, so you can expect that in the next few days to get a sense of how small it actually is I before we go on to the next slide I just give a tip out there to teams that um, if you want to have a, a good insight into different ways that people could hang when they're restricted, like by the side of the bar like that, you might want to go to 2004, uh, go to the World Championships and just see how teams actually did do those types of hangs. That might be helpful. Okay, Chris, back to you. Okay. Can you move to the next slide for me? There we go. Good, good game, bad game. There we go. <laughs> That's our first question. Uh, I'm going to throw this out to, let's see, let's start with Obi. Do you want to comment on this one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think it's always hard to tell with the first game, whether it's a good game or a bad game before the first match is played. But I think um, based on the kind of the strategies involved in this game, you know, versus previous years, I think this is going to be a, a good game just because there's so many different uh, ways this game can be played compared to a game like Stronghold or uh, Steamworks. Okay, any other questions or comments from any of our panelists? Pretty much consensus there. Okay, how about we'll go to Sandra from 4903 for ideas on types of wheels.
That's funny because we were just talking about what types of wheels. Um, <laughs> we we have ruled out Mechanum. Um, we were toying between the wheels that's in the um, the kit compared to um, pneumatic wheels. Um, so we're still on the edge of which one we're going to go with there. Okay. And are there any other comments from anyone else that's on the panel tonight? Um, uh, Michael, I have a few comments on that. Sure. Great. So, um, so one of the tough parts about RA3D, I'm sure Brennan can touch on this, is uh, buying all the parts beforehand because you really have no idea what the game is going to be. So you kind of got to buy a few generic parts. And um, so we had an inkling from a lot of, you know, all the conspiracies that go around that pneumatic wheels would be very useful in this game because there's going to be some kind of terrain going on. And it turns out that there's really not that much terrain going on in the game um, besides the uh, the platform zones. And so even though we got these pneumatic wheels, we never ended up using them um, because uh, they're just a little too bulky and don't drive around well. We ended up using very large Colson wheels. And um, we found those to be the best for this game because uh, we, uh, as far as strategy is concerned, we think speed is a very important thing in this game because you really need to do a lot of cycles, kind of like gears in uh, Steamworks. Um, control is also important. That's where Colson's come in handy is, uh, as they wear down, um, they still have a lot of traction and they're, they're, they're pretty good wheels for speed, but also um, agility at the same time. And, uh, but the thing teams have to look out for is having wheels that are big enough to get up the platform. If your wheels, if you pick two small wheels, you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to drive up that platform and um, you're just gonna get stuck and you won't be able to climb at the end. Right, and John indicated it's about a three inch rise. Is that yeah, correct? Uh, well, I know well, it's gonna be three and a half inches plus um, three quarter inches, so roughly four inches high to the top of it. And then if there's Lexan on top of that, which make it slipperier. The key to think about is if you go back a couple of years ago when we were stacking those bins, and that was a low platform, but think about it being twice as high as that at least. So the, one of the other issues, not just the size of the wheel, but the clearance of the chassis um, to where the outside of the wheel touches the floor. So whatever that clearance zone is, you're going to want it to be uh, a certain amount so that you don't get stuck in the middle when you're trying to go up the ramp. And I'm talking about, for example, if you're trying to drive up like right here on the screen, and if your robot's going to bottom out, that's going to be a big problem that a few of the newer teams that don't have a chance to access a field um, apparatus, they, they may run into that. So it's a good tip. Those are good tips. Thanks. Any other comments from any of other other panelists before we move on to our next question? Yes, Brendan. Um, okay. We ran uh, four inch Colson's in RI3 just because that's the only wheels that we had access to. Um, don't run them. Um, <laughs> they will not climb up the platform zone. Um, if you make your robot to the um, uh, max uh, volume uh, dimensions uh, for the starting configuration, um, you Brennan, need at least six inch wheels. Yeah, Brennan, get. what size um, are you using? What drivetrain configuration is it? Six wheel, four wheel? What are you doing? We ran a six wheel West Coast drive with uh, Colson's and Vex Versa blocks. And how much clearance did you have? Uh, not enough. We couldn't uh, climb it. Yeah, I would guess about one and a half or at the most, right? Um, no, like uh, if we were climbing up onto the platform, um, if we weren't going like fast enough, and I don't think we ever managed to um, get the uh, robot going fast enough to just push itself over. Um, it would beach itself on the platform wow. on the angle there. Very important point. Okay, so moving on to our next question, then I'm going to throw this one over to Cassidy. Um, what's the best way, in your opinion, to score points this year? Um, it's Cassidy from 2013. I definitely believe the best way to score points is through ownership of the switch and the scale. Um, I find these ways like to maintain ownership as well. So um, when you get it, like you get as well, you can use time in your favor um, to get those points. And I think it's a lot easier to once you get it to maintain it rather than continuously losing it again and working beyond. Um, I feel like 
once you are able to maintain your switch, I definitely think the scale will be advantageous for teams to um, address because um, it's essentially, if each team owns its own scale, or sorry, if each team owns its own switch, then the scale is almost the determining factor of the match. Great. And anything else? Does anybody else have anything to add to that or a different opinion, perhaps? Um, I definitely agree with Cassavius' Shifa from 188. Um, I think that getting an early advantage on the scale is, is huge and almost, uh, I feel like if the, the team or the alliance that gets the ownership of both the switch and the scale first maybe determines um, the match uh, most often. So it's harder to give up a lead and harder to get the lead once, once you've gotten it. And both of those ways are like by getting the switch and, and getting the scale and it depends on how fast and maybe that's a scouting tip for everybody to to note down how fast it is and um, that the other alliance gets the, the scale. If that's what they go for, then maybe that's also what you go for, you race to it. Okay, great. And <laughs> there's a good question for all of us. How do you play this game? So I'm gonna throw that one back to you, Shiva. Right, so I think it's, um I know when, one of the things Paul had asked us to, to think about was what makes sense for, for rookie teams or second year teams to focus on as well as um, what complementary robots look like. And all of, all of those things are, are a priority. So there's so much going on on the field that it's really important to get your priority straight and, and solidify your role as a robot, whether it's um, that you're a really great switch robot or, or you're only focusing on, on the exchange zones. So I think whatever, I know there's gonna be lots of robots that can hopefully do everything, but um, being really good at one or two of those priorities um, is really useful. Okay, and do any, does anybody else have anything else to add to that, um, to Shifa's comments there from the panel? Oh yeah, one thing we'd like to say is, um, especially for lower um, resource teams, uh, I think the, the Vault is a really, really powerful um, game piece uh, this year. Um, with nine teams, you can score uh, a large amount of points. I think it's, it's almost 100. I think 95 points, yeah, pretty much guaranteed if you if you get all nine cubes inside the vault. And those cubes are basically stacked up for you right in front of the vault. Um, so if you don't have the resources um, or you know the the, the time um, to make a really competitive scale robot or a really powerful climb robot, yeah. um, you know it's it's okay. You know, the, if you focus on doing certain game tasks, you can still uh, create a very powerful robot. Right, so the idea of sort of doing one thing really exceptionally well, right? Is that sort of what you're getting uh, yeah. at? Yeah. Right, okay. Anybody else have anything to add? Okay, let's go on to the next question then. Where are the points? Gabe, we'll throw this one over to you. So a lot of the points, the, the obvious answer is the climb. If you get all three robots in the air, that's that's 90 points. And like, that's a lot of points there. Again, the vault is a lot of points as well. Like Rose just said, it's it's almost 100 points itself for the nine cubes. Yeah, it's potentially 100 points for the, yeah, 115 points for the vault. Um, I think the, the game deciders will be the scale. Because to do a switch robot is not incredibly difficult. It's it's completely feasible for for a rookie team. It'll be uh, it'll be the scale that'll decide matches. Okay. Any other opinions or ideas out there? Okay, and we'll move on. Some. Ah, oh, some interesting rules. Okay. Um, Feroz, maybe you can talk to some of these points. Um, maximum robot heights. Sure, I think uh, maximum robot height, starting configuration is 55 inches, and then after that, there's there's no limit on the height. Um, right. In terms of power-ups, they're, you know, very powerful, obviously. All, all three, um, levitate, force, and boost, uh, where force and levitate are, are guaranteed points. Uh, and boost is just a, a multiplier, basically. Um, so if used correctly and at the correct times, they're they're very powerful for not only getting U points, um, but 
denying the opposing alliance points. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's very powerful, right? That every uh, every point that you deny your alliance, uh, sorry, your, the opposing alliance, uh, is, is just like scoring a point for yourself. Um, right, and that's where the importance of scouting other teams comes in too, right? It's watching for those things as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and yeah. recognizing what the, uh, the capabilities of, of the opposing alliance is. You know, if you know that they can't, for example, climb, that would definitely change your strategy. Um, if, or as opposed to if you know they had a really, really quick climber or a really uh, excellent scale robot. All great points. Anyone else have anything to add on that from our panel? Um, I have a few things, Michael. Sure. Yeah. Um, so power ups are also like, like, uh, like you said, um, there's a lot of strategy going on around there, especially with denying, and I agree with a lot of what was just said. Um, but to me, the rules around cubes and climbs are super interesting, and we're going to have to wait and see what the Q&A says. But um, with climbs, a lot of teams have kind of discovered the the interesting rule around how a climb is kind of decided. And so there's a lot of interesting things that teams have thought of. So you know, some teams have thought of um, making ramps that come off of a robot and allowing other robots to simply drive up instead of having to climb um, to get a full scale. Um, it's been posed that you could flip your robot upside down and that counts as a scale. Um, there's a lot of interesting rules around there and um, teams should really wait and see what the Q&A says about that because um, depending on what the Q&A says is legal and not legal, it'll be a lot like the Velcro rope last year where a lot of teams discovered, hey, if you have a Velcro rope, that makes climbing really easy last year. Um, but you know, if the Q&A said that's illegal, then um, a lot of teams would have had a much tougher time. So before, I, my recommendation to teams would be before you fully solidify your climbing idea, wait and see what Q&A says because some things that you might think of might be illegal. Um, and then with cubes, so the, the interesting thing to note is the whole physics thing they kind of made clear in the video. So about how even though there's one cube on each side of the scale, depending on how far away the cube is from the center of the scale, one team will have favor. Um, and so the interesting about, thing about that is um, we kind of thought that, especially if teams are cycling at about the same speed, the scale of the switch will almost always have the same amount of cubes on them at each time if the teams are equally um, ma matched in that sense. You know, there will never be one and two cubes on a scale or one and two cubes on a switch. There could be if one alliance is much better than the other, but in most cases and throughout the majority of the game, there will be one cube or two cubes on each side of the scale. And so um, in our opinion, that means that teams that can place cubes strategically onto the scale and onto the switch to make sure they're as far away from the center as possible um, will have the advantage. And so teams that are trying to shoot their cubes up um, when the, in, the, in the null zone um, will have a worse, uh, will have a harder time than teams who can, you know, strategically grab and place a cube onto the scale platform uh, well. Those are some really, really excellent points. And I hope that um everyone uh, takes note of those things because those are the sorts of things that can make a big difference um, in how the game ends up. So that's really great. Anybody else have anything else to add to that? Christine, I would like to just mm -hmm. add a point that um, sure. today I was standing beside the scale and um, I was, it's able, you're able to tip it in favor of one side or the other with one finger push. It's that true. I guess you could say it. So as uh, Brendan was saying, the placement of that cube into the so-called platform or hop or whatever it is on each side, um, the further in, you're actually giving an advantage to the other side, I guess. So I know that just so everybody else who's not going to get a chance to see one of those, they move very easy. That's a very important Right. And, and John, can you you just go over where in Ontario we have um, our full field set up so that um, teams are aware so that if they have the opportunity or even somebody on their team is in the area they might be able to drop by and see one in person sure and one of the things I don't want to do is uh, not mention a field that's out there so if I fail to mention it please let me know and we'll post it on our first Canada website so that everybody's got um, some type of exposure in terms of where teams could go but I know off the hop, we, we've got Studica, of course, which is Mississauga at 410 and um, Courtney Park, roughly. We've got John Polani Collegiate Institute in Toronto, just 10 minutes um, 
east of the 400 or 10 minutes west of the 404 and just ever so slightly south of the 401. Those two venues will have a full field, as well as the Hamilton field, I believe um, will have a full field set up um, with significant game parts too. 1114, as mentioned, they have a field. And then we have Victoria Park, which has a three-quarter field. And I know by talking to them today, they plan to have as many game element pieces there as possible too. So the more we can help our Ontario teams by giving them access to these venues will be very helpful for teams to gain a perspective. Great. And do we have any other questions, John, uh, on our slides? Okay, here we go. Let's go back to OB for this one. What would be a good rookie robot and or rookie robot appealing to strong veteran teams? Uh, Maybe I think... you could explain, first of all, why you want to be appealing to a strong veteran team. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> It's it's always good to be appealing to a strong veteran team when you're a rookie robot because uh, statistically speaking, most rookies don't seed high. They seed you know in the middle of the pack, maybe the bottom of the pack, um, and they want a, a robot that uh, looks good in the elimination uh, for when the, the the stronger team, you know, the high seeds are picking uh, as a first or second pick, right? Uh, I think in this game, a good rookie robot is one that's really good at uh, manipulating the cubes on the on the bottom level and getting them in the, the switch and through that exchange uh, to the vault. Okay. Any other opinions on this one or, or thoughts? Uh, Br Brendan. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, Brendan, um, Team Ontario RA3D. Um, just taking a look at the, the size of the field, um, if you can play uh, effective strategic defense on teams, you can really shut down their scoring opportunities and um, cause, uh, because the points are time-based, cause yourself to accumulate more points. Um, so I think there's a really good opportunity for a lot of defense in this game. That's great. And Chippa, you had some points? Yeah, I think also um, for a team to focus on um, a consistent hang, so that's something that teams will be looking at, is if you can get that hang, it's one less, if, especially if you can get that levitate power up, it would be really useful to have a robot or a second pick that you know for sure is going to hang uh, consistently, consistently, sorry. Okay, anybody else have anything to add before? Uh, Michael, uh, okay. UW, RA3D. And so I completely agree with Brendan, I think defense will be super important in this game especially because the scale kind of, uh, like a lot of people have already said, determines the winner in most situations. Um, but then on top of that, um, especially for rookie teams that want to get picked by a good veteran team, I think a collaborative climbing robot, like was like uh, how Shifu was just talking about, a good climbing robot would be good. Um, a robot that lets other high-powered veteran teams climb would be a very good addition because um, that kind of robot will let the, the veteran teams focus on scoring and uh, have a good robot that can score effectively and then have less uh, put less focus into climbing. And so a rookie team that could, you know, maybe have ramps that deploy and allow um, other teams to climb or have a robot that can climb and has a bar that extends out for other teams to climb on to make more area. Um, that kind of robot would be really attractive to veteran teams, in my opinion. Interesting ideas. Great. And any more questions, John? Haha. <laughs> uh, uh, Cassidy, let's get you to answer this one. Not a problem. So I'm Cassidy again from 2013. Um, I think one of the best ways, if you were to put something on a first or second pick robot, was to um, manipulate the vault or like add boxes to the vault. So they're, all you would need is a pushing mechanism that can cradle them if there is a team that doesn't have or a, a very slim robot. Um, that way they can have at least a team doing something out of the way, but they have their own tasks to focus on. Um, and again, really easy to make and really easy to implement on uh, picks. Sure. And can you take a moment to Cassidy and just explain this cheesecake term for the rookies that are on the call? Uh, so cheesecake is typically a term that uh, first, like 
the first robot in the alliance will use um, in order to add something or manipulate uh, the other picks in some way that can improve them or make them more um, for their abilities or how they can match better with them. So it's essentially you're like, oh, I have a, like last year, an example would be like a cheesecake climber for a team that doesn't, that couldn't climb. Right, so, um, so one team is providing another team with a component that they're going to add on to um, their robot, basically, right? Okay, great. Uh, any other thoughts on this? Uh, I think, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, not quite a cheesecake. Just one thing. One thing for rookie teams to to kind of note is um, the autonomous period, especially in qualification rounds, uh, is very important. Being able to just simply drive to the auto line um, is is really, really, really important for getting that one ranking point. Uh, it's, it's equivalent to tying the match, even if you lose. Um, just want to note that it's not really a cheesecake. Just a just a right. Just a really important thing for rookies to keep in mind that that autonomous mode is critical to uh, an alliance. Yeah, great. Shifa, you had something. Yeah, just in terms of the the cheesecaking as well. For if rookies are looking into that or, or um, teams are looking into that, it'll be important to um, factor in weight. So when you have um, something that gets added on, it's important to just keep that in mind. Right. Um, and also just uh with. With what Fero said, it's important to um, make sure that that auto mobility is like that's a must. That for sure every team will be looking for, especially uh, those veteran teams. Great. Okay. Any other questions, John? I'm not sure how many more slides we have to go through, and I'm aware that our time is pretty well run out here, but we'll keep going at least till the end of the slides. Well, this is a question for the uh, Robot M3 Days groups. Okay. So Michael and Brendan. Yep. So um, I guess I can speak. Uh, our robot has uh, it's been stowed away at a UW locker, and so it's ready to go whenever um, we have the opportunity to show uh, the robot to the public. And we're actually really excited. I'm sure Brendan from RA3D Ontario is also really excited because um, just this whole experience was so much fun for us. And having, it's honestly, it's it, it was such a uh, an incredible feeling having a robot done in three days. And I can't wait to talk about, you know, the failures, the successes um, on the robot. And so um, we'll be able to, see, you'll be able to see our robot really soon. Great. Excellent. And just to let you know, Brendan, that, um, the, the Studica field, for example, will be, we have a full field up now, um, but we don't have the game elements. They will be up on the end of day Friday. So start to try to target your time at uh, the weekend or just after, and so that we could help other teams across the province to be able to come and visit and see face to face what that robot looks like. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, we are going to hopefully not only be taking it to uh, that Studica field, but also um, there are a few events uh, that we are seeing if we can get into, and we'll just have it there, showing it off to the public, not necessarily FRC. Um, but no, uh, Robot in Three Days was awesome, as Michael said, and really, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm looking forward to next year or... Uh, <laughs> uh, just for the awesome feeling during, but right now I'm really tired. So uh. yeah, me too. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to both of you for and your groups for um, for taking that talent on because it is a real asset to the rest of us that that don't have that opportunity or the resources to be able to do something that quickly because it certainly helps us all and I think we're all the better for it. So thank you for doing that and making your findings available to everyone. And thank you to everybody for sharing tonight, too. So, John, do you want to take over the last part of this? Um, yeah, I had mentioned that. Webinar? Yeah, um, so Mr. Keenan is uh, releasing tonight. The uh, It'll be on Facebook, I believe, and perhaps on our first kind of the website. The Rules Quiz Contest. And there will be, of course, some super fantastic first swag. Um, and that will be available for the ones that are the winners, and that's going to be sometime soon. Um, and if you guys haven't seen that first swag yet, it's pretty impressive. We've got quite the uh, selection this year, so um, don't don't wait till it's too late and everything's sold out. There's some great things this year. Yeah, and Chris, I just wonder if we could just go through each panelist with one statement to end things off, a, a closing comment. 
that whack sure. things out there. Sure. Why don't we start off with Brendan then? Um, I just like to mention, um, make sure you read the rules entirely. Keep up to date with the uh, Q and A. Um, there will be important changes in there, uh, and you don't want to be caught off guard at your first event having to saw off two inches of your um, your drive because you're overweight or over size. Great advice, Michael. How about you? Uh, yeah, and um, so I'd like to talk about kind of what the public can get out of Robot in Three Days. So the main Robot in Three Days group in Florida has kind of been making a push this year to change um, the way teams view it, because what a lot of teams in the past would do is they'd look at RA3D and think, oh, hey, that's a mechanism I can copy. And that's not really what Robot in Three Days is about and what you should gain from it, because um, our mechanisms are just that. They were built in three days, and if you try to copy our mechanisms, you're not going to be as good as you probably want to be. Our mechanisms are good prototypes, they're good ideas, and they're good um, focuses on strategy. And so as long as you look at us and you look at our bots in, a, in an idea, in a way of, oh, how can I improve on, on this idea? How can I improve on this concept? And, and the most importantly, how can I make the best robot um, to the strategy? Um, you'll have a much better time than if you look at our robots and you go, you know, hey, I wanna copy this robot, it's not gonna go well. Excellent points. For us, how about you? Uh, I just want to say um, there's been a, a lot of hype around um, ramp robots. I know a lot of people are maybe not old enough to remember 2007, um, but my team did build a ramp robot. Uh, things to, to consider is that um, even if you build one, they are heavy, they are awkward, uh, they block driver sight lines. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying don't do it. Just uh, be cognizant of the fact that they're not as easy as uh, you perhaps think that they are. Mm, great. Uh, Gabe? Uh, I guess I'll comment on, uh, Froze commented earlier on the autocross. Just to reiterate um, how, how important that is and how actually it, simple it is in a way. Um, I believe the rules state that the bumper only has to cross the auto line. If you look at the field, um, Really, even if you're a rookie team and you have no idea how to do like um, control loops or anything like that, there's a completely viable auto there where all you do is just drive into the switch and let the switch stop you or just do it with timers. And it, it, it's, really, it's really important and it will, it'll make a big difference. Good points, good points. Shifa. Um, so I, I like the, I think my make sure you read the manual got got stolen really early on, but make sure that like all members of the drive team, anybody like essentially the entire team should be reading this manual, um, especially if you're on the field. I know there's a new technician role that's going to be really useful, um, but also to feel comfortable to reach out to the rest of the community, like other teams in your area, um, because build season is usually, I know everybody's pressed for time, but they're also the most willing to um, communicate and collaborate. So um, there's a lot of great resources online, but also within your own community. Great. And Cassidy. Um, so really one thing to think about um, when you're making your robots, once you decide or once you figure out what is legal and what's not, prototype early, get your comp competition, sorry, um, robot finished and then do some practicing because I think um, how high the scale is and all the different types of things, you're going to need some practice, especially if you want to get those cycles done in like fast. So definitely prototype early, but also, yeah, like what Brendan said, make sure he know it's legal before you begin. Great words of wisdom. Uh, Sandra, do you have anything to add to that or any advice? Well, for me, um, obviously, I've been sitting quiet back here, but I totally agree and um, on the same page as everybody. Um, I think that um, scouting is going to be key. Um, so have some good... Um, scouting sheets and figure out what robot is going to be great with your robot. Okay. And Obi. Uh, I think uh, as a mentor coming from uh, a second year team, I think it's really important for the rookie team to, um, to know their limits in terms of their budgets and their time. Um, but at the same time, they shouldn't sell themselves short, right? They should, they should know that they're capable of building a robot, uh, that can play this game well because it's 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 not a simple game, but it's a game uh, that I think a lot of rookie teams can excel in. And um, 
just to sort of know that they don't have to go to competition uh, and be the cheesecake for uh, the first seed, right? They can play their own game this year. Nice, yeah. Um, and I'm just going to add on to that. Um, my words of wisdom, I guess, that I'd like to share. Um, I just want to remind teams to ask for help and ask for help early. We have first senior mentors and staff across the province, and there are so many teams out there that are willing to help you. So please reach out because um, that's sort of what the first culture is like, and we're all here to help and support you. So don't forget to do it. Don't be shy. It's uh, it's really important, even as a, a more experienced team, it's still important. So. Um, back to you now, John. Yeah, I was just going to add in, I was trying to find the slideshow from the kickoff. Uh, a lot of great information shared tonight. Um, <laughs> that I might add as a, a lingering tip for many, many teams, whether they're rookies and or um, uh, veteran teams. Uh, and some of you mentioned part of this already. Understand the game. Know and understand the game so that when you go and you play with your Lions partners, is probably going to be very frustrating if you show up and you don't understand that game. And that's really going to be a determining factor on who's going to win. And Chris, as you just said, uh, we have the online um, help desk uh, ushered by Team 1114, and that's on our website, as well as one in Windsor at Team 772, one in Mississauga at uh, Rick Hansen Secondary School, and one at St. Robert's out there in the GTA area. So those are three hubs that we have. I know we have a lot of other great veteran teams that help teams, but um, make sure, as Christine says, that you read to ask for help. And good luck to everyone. And do we have a trivia question for tonight, or do you know? I'm sorry? Do we have a trivia question for Swag? Well. I don't know if we do. Let's create one right now. <laughs> So um, I'm going to pick uh, Shifa to uh, raise one question that we think almost everybody in first should know. And we'll make that oh. a question. No pressure. Everybody in first Canada? <laughs> oh, can we do, can you name all of Christine's children with the right oh. name? <laughs> name all I, don't them. Know that, I don't know that that one's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give okay, them a hint and tell them? <laughs> or how many uh, district competitions we have in Ontario? There you go. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Now, um, I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to give any tips away. So anyway, uh, I think that's all, Chris. Um, thanks, everyone. Yep. This was terrific. And, we've got a and we'll put work. some follow-up notes in Friday's email blast for everyone because hopefully by then we'll have some video to share um, from our friends that did the robot in three days. Um, and as well, keep your eye out for those Friday email blasts because that's where you're going to find the information that's most pertinent to Ontario teams. Excellent. Chris, could we do a trivia question number two? I just want to throw one in there and we can give them a nice sure. for this. <laughs> name the, uh, the, the names of the practice fields that we identified tonight. Okay. okay, and you're going to email those answers to Paul Keenan, P. Keenan at firstinspires.org. Great. Okay, thanks so much, everybody. Good night.